Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Welcome to Robbins Library. I'm Andrea Nikolai, the Assistant Director here, and I'm thrilled to uh, invite Science for the Public here tonight. Uh, Dr. Thomas Dame, thank you for coming. Um, Yvonne, it's been a pleasure working with you. We're really delighted to have two of the lectures in this wonderful series. So um, welcome to those of you who have never been here, and welcome back to those of you who have. Good evening. I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to this science lecture tonight. And tonight, it's our great privilege to welcome Thomas Dane, director of the Radio Telescope Data Center at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and lecturer at, of astronomy uh, at Harvard University. Dr. Dane received his PhD from Columbia University and then was a research associate first in the Department of Astronomy at Columbia University and then at NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies in New York. He joined the staff of the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics as a research astronomer in 1986 and the faculty of Harvard University as a lecturer in 1988. Dr. Dane is a member of the American Astronomical Society and his many awards include the prestigious Secretary's Research Prize from the Smithsonian Institution in 2009. Although his publications are technical, his discoveries have been described for a more general public and they're very readable in magazines such as Scientific American, Discovery, and Science News. I believe I've got some links on our website for you. You'd find the links to the background information about the project itself that he's going to talk about on the Science for the Public webpage for this lecture. Dr. Dame is especially distinguished for his team's radio telescope survey of the entire Milky Way and for the discovery of two unknown spiral arms in our galaxy. This decades-long project as a whole is a huge accomplishment in astrophysics. It was based on two important factors, both of which represented scientific innovations. First was the focus on huge clouds of dense molecular gas in the galaxy, and second was the use of small, nearly identical telescopes in opposite atmospheres. Dr. Dane will explain for us the significance of these factors. We'll learn also about the challenges of this work, what it's revealed, and how it was accomplished. Dr. Dane has given invited lectures all over the United States and the world, so we are really honored to have him with us tonight to bring this great story of his project to the general public. Please welcome Dr. Thomas Dane. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for that very nice introduction. Um, I, also, well, I also appreciate each and every one of you for coming out tonight, braving the, the, uh, the uh, snow piles and the traffic on, um, on Mass Ave. Uh, it's very gratifying that you want to come and hear about our research. We have two radio telescopes that are virtually identical, one in each hemisphere, and so we have access to the entire Milky Way, and if we want the entire sky with, with, with complete uniformity, right? No, no troubles with reconciling differences in, 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 tech, in the uh, equipment and so on. The data collected by these telescopes have produced 24 PhDs within our research group, over the years, hundreds of research papers, and as uh, Yvonne mentioned, uh, two of the three significant spiral arm discoveries that have been made over the past 40 years. Okay, so we will move on. This is one of the few bullet, 
bullet slides I will have, I promise. But just to tell you what's coming up, this, uh, you know, in 50 minutes, you can't summarize 35 years of research. But I'm, my, my goals are fairly modest. I'm going to tell you about the telescopes, show you pictures, of course. I'm going to talk, talk about you know, what we observe with these telescopes what, and why those things are important. Uh, how do we do it? So talk about a little bit about the instrumentation and the data collection and the data analysis. How do we make sense of what, we, what we're observing? Uh, what does the data look like? Uh, why does it? Why has it taken us 35 years to to carry out this project, and and and, and is still going strong? Uh, then I'll talk about the, the Milky Way survey that you've seen on this on this poster. Oops. Uh, which and, and by the way, I, again, because I'm grateful for you all to come out, I, I I brought copies of this poster if anyone wishes to take one and contemplate it at home. Okay. And uh, finally, I'll I'll discuss some of our recent results uh, on the structure of the Milky Way. Okay, so the telescopes. Um, the, this telescope was built uh, in 1974 by a fairly small research group at Columbia University. This sits on the top of the Pupin Physics Building, or it did in, in, in the middle of Manhattan, about 100 yards off of Broadway at 116th Street. You can see the Empire State Building in the background. And this is the World Trade Center over here when this picture was taken. Um, it's only, as I said, they're very small. It's only four feet across. It looks like it should be sitting on somebody's roof picking up hundreds of um, cable stations, right? MTV, <laughs> right? It's not impressive to look at. Um, uh, and also notice that it's not the most ideal, uh, ideal location. There's this huge old historic optical telescope which produces an artificial horizon, which we had to have programmed into our software so we knew when, when we lost our signal in the west. Um, now, w why is it that we can observe in the middle of a, of a city with such a small telescope? And both of those, the answer to both of those things is because we observe at a very high frequency about a thousand times higher than FM radio stations. The observing frequency is 115,271 megahertz. Uh, you know, a thousand megahertz is a gigahertz, so it's 115 gigahertz. And the corresponding wavelength, you know, there's always a, a, an inverse relationship between frequency and wavelengths. The wavelength is 2.6 millimeters. The key point to, uh, that I want to emphasize is that the resolving power of any telescope uh, depends on the relative sizes of the wavelength of the radiation you're looking at and the aperture of your collector, whether it's, whether it's a, a lens or a mirror, which is essentially what this is. For us, this is a mirror, a perfect mirror for the microwaves that are coming in uh, to be observed. So because we're looking at a very short radio wavelength, we can scale down our dish in proportion. Um, and so we obtain, so, so the, our ability to see details in the sky are as good as those of the big 100 meter telescopes you see in textbooks because they're generally observing at 100 times longer wavelength. Okay, so we're observing, and that, that also uh, accounts for why we can observe in the city because there's virtually no radio interference at these, at these frequencies. At 1,000 times lower frequencies, you have FM, AM, uh, taxi cabs, air traffic controllers, uh, cell phones, but, but as my, my own thesis advisor used to uh, like to say, at this frequency, New York City was as quiet as the day Henry Hudson sailed up the river. No interference whatsoever. And that's true also now in Cambridge. Um, so no interference. Um, in 1986, for, for a lot of reasons, we decided to move from Columbia to, to uh, the Harvard Center for Astrophysics. Uh, he, he, here is the moment, uh, the uh, quite unsettling moment. When, when our engineer, Sam Palmer, actually used a jigsaw to cut through all of the cables that were running from our control room on the top floor of the physics building to the roof. And that was definitely the point of no return. And we knew we were going, we were going to Cambridge. Um, <clears throat> here's, our, here's our current location um, uh, on the historic building D at the Center for Astrophysics. This is not normally how we see the telescope. Normally, we observe through this Gore-Tex screen, which is about 99% transparent to the, to the radio waves, but this, you know, for the sake of the photograph. Uh, strangely enough, we still have to contend with a, a big old optical telescope. Who brought that with you? Uh, we didn't want to bring anything. We didn't want to bring that, but this, this one is even more historic. I don't want to go off on tangents, but that's a, a very historic instrument that was built in uh, 1847 during the American Civil War. It was the largest uh, optical telescope in the country. Um, it was the premier instrument of the United States. 
I've made a lot of important uh, discoveries, but this is another picture. This is how we normally, here's the Gore-Tex screen is down now. I don't even know who took this picture, but I like it very much because it sort of indicates how the old, old telescope is all shut down and, and you have all this light from the city, this light pollution reflecting off the cloud, so it's cloudy, and yet we're still observing a way over here. So we can observe through the clouds, we can observe night and day. We have some problems with you know, wet, wet weather, but for the most part, we just chug along day and night uh, regardless of the, of the, uh, the clouds. Um, that's just a peek at the, uh, the Great Refractor, which I, I like very much. And uh, every third Thursday of the, of, the, of the month at the Center for Astrophysics, they have an open house, and you can go and, and, go and visit that. Um, this is the, um, uh, the counterpart, which we built in 1982. It's basically a clone of the first one. Right? So once you have all the designs and everything, it's always easy to build another one. So, so we built another one in 1982, and we brought it down to Cerro Tololo Observatory in Chile in the Andes Mountains. And so this is a comparable picture. Um, that was there from 1982 until 2011. Very recently, they moved it to Santiago to, to be on the campus of the University of Chile so that they could operate in, in, a, in a vein very much like we do, using it not only for research, but also for teaching. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a, in a while. Uh, this is, a, I showed you the view from New York City. Here's our view from the Andes Mountains. Quite a, quite a different view, but just as spectacular. So what do we observe with this telescope? Um, all right, so if you went outside tonight, if, if the clouds have held off, and you look to the west at exactly, ex exactly this time, this is almost exactly what you would see, minus the white lines. Okay? But a lot of you, if you have any interest in astronomy, any amateur astronomers, will know what constellation this is. Anyone? Orion, thank you. Oh, educated class. Educated. Okay, so there's the Orion constellation. And the very first uh, spectrum that we took with our northern telescope was on this little object here, this little red patch. Does anyone know what that is? Someone does, I can tell. No? The Orion Nebula. It's the nearest region of massive star formation. You can see with your eyes, it's a little red patch. And uh, I'll zoom in, in, zoom in, in, in there for you. Uh, here it is. So this is a, 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 just a sort of a nice picture of the Orion Nebula. This is a region where uh, massive stars are forming. Uh, they're, they're burning their fuel at a copious rate. They're producing a lot of ultraviolet radiation. And they're ionizing the gas. And so the gas is glowing by fluorescence. Okay, so this is called an H2 region. It's a region of ionized hydrogen. Uh, and what you can see in front of the H2 region, so these are new stars that are forming. There are four in particular that are called the trapezium that are very famous f with amateur astronomers. They love to photograph it. But you can see in front of the, in front of the H2 region is this dark material, right, which is blocking our view. And that's very dense. That's the very dense gas out of which those stars formed. Okay. Now, the reason we looked toward the Orion Nebula for our first observation is that it had been found that there was actually some molecular gas in that direction. Now, up until about 1970, people thought that molecules were extremely rare in the galaxy and in the universe at large. People thought that the whole subject of chemistry uh, was a very provincial subject, that it stopped a few miles above our heads. Because once, if you took a typical molecule like CO, carbon monoxide, you just left it in a typical place between the stars, it'll be very quickly dissociated, busted apart by the ultraviolet radiation that pervades it, it, the, the space. Okay, so, so no one expected that there'd be, there'd be many molecules. So molecules were, you could find them in these tiny little out of the way places like planets, but they don't amount to much mass. Okay, most of the, most of the mass is in stars, and that's ionized, right? So it's not even atoms, it's atoms that have been ripped apart, so the electrons are pulled off, so you have ionized gas, but very little molecules. Anyways, it was not too surprising that there was some molecular gas here. Some, you know, there had been a detection of some emission from, from carbon monoxide molecules, which happens to be an important molecule in this discussion. And uh, that was not too disgusting because, because this gas is very, very dense because it's, it's forming size. It's collapsed gravitationally. And, and, and what it's done is, is it mixed in with the gas is a little bit of dust. And that's crucial to this whole... Um, experiment in the whole situation because that dust, what the dust does is block out the ultraviolet radiation. So if you were inside one of these dense clouds and you looked out, you wouldn't see any stars. It would be literally dark. Because, and so no ultraviolet radiation is able to get in and that allows these fragile molecules to form. But what was not anticipated was how extensive the molecular gas was. 
Um, so let me go back to this picture. Okay, and what I'm going to show you now is uh, this was is our, one of our first maps of a so-called giant molecular cloud. So this is what you see with your eyes, and this is what we see with our radio telescope. Okay, and it's it's quite amazing because if you think about it, if you went out and you could see this thing, it would be as big as a thunder thunder cloud, you know, hanging over your house. Right? It's like that big in the sky, and no one had any clue about these objects. Um, you know, 40 years ago, okay? And this is the classic giant molecular cloud. And if you go back to, if I can go back to the previous slide, you can see that this is, of course, a false color, just like a weather map telling you how hard it's raining, right? But you can see that the strongest emission that we detected is exactly where the Orion Nebula is, right? But I remember doing this map, and we were all astonished at, at how how the, the, the cloud just kept going and going and going. I remember the graduate student who was mapping this cloud, he got a piece of graph paper, and the gra piece of graph paper was about that big, right? And he made little boxes, and he wrote the number in each box of how strong the signal was, and they said, whoa, it went, off the, it went off the graph paper. So he got another piece of graph paper, and he taped it on, and he kept going, and he got another piece of graph paper. And by the time the season was over, the graph paper was as, as big as the floor, floor area here, literally. And it was just getting more and more unruly, and it just kept going and going. It was totally unexpected. Um, and so what we're seeing here is one of these um, giant molecular clouds. Which, and so now let me show you maybe a picture that you might be familiar with. This is one of the famous pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is a, this is a little piece of a molecular cloud. Right? And so yeah, this is the dark, dense molecular gas with dust mixed in, and of course the dust is crucial for keeping, keeping it alive, keeping, the, keeping the, the uh, molecules from being dissociated. You see young stars forming. This is a very bright star, which is literally you know, melting away these pillars uh, through, through, the, through its ultraviolet radiation. So it's, it's just like an icicle that's melting. So these things will eventually uh, just disappear. And you can see these little globules where the gas is even denser, and there's probably a star forming in here, for example which will eventually emerge. This is my favorite. This is another Hubble, spell, Hubble telescope picture of a, a little piece of a molecular cloud. And what I love about this is that it, it, it literally looks like a cocoon. It's a, it really gives you a three-dimensional sense. This is all molecular gas. And you see that inside this little cavity is, is, are these young stars which have lit, lit up the inside of the, of the cavity. Um, and they're busting out you know, from the, from the molecular gas. So, mo so the molecular clouds are the star factories of the galaxy. Virtually all star formation takes place in these clouds. Okay, so you can actually see molecular clouds with your eyes, uh, not from Arlington, not from Cambridge, but if you go to Maine, or if you go someplace really dark, you can see the molecular clouds as a band running along the Milky Way, right? So a lot of you have probably seen the Milky Way. You have to go someplace far away. But, but all of this dark material uh, is the molecular gas, okay? Now, years ago, uh, 100 years ago, uh, these regions were thought to be actual holes in the star density, right? These are places where there were fewer, fewer stars. But I can prove to you, using our data, that they're not holes, okay? So th th this is just a, another panorama of the Milky Way. It's just been laid out in a rectangular way. Uh, the galactic center in the middle, and then the anti-center at either end. So this wraps all the way around the sky. Uh, I'm going to pull out a little piece of it, and then what I'm going to do is overlay again uh, one of our maps from our telescope, and I'm going to have it blink. Okay, And you can see how all of those dark regions, which had previously been thought to be actual holes in the, in the gas density, uh, holes in the star density, are actually glowing in this emission that we observe, right? And it's a beautiful correlation, right? Every place where it's dark, that's where the molecules form, and we're detecting the emission from those dense molecular clouds, OK? Um, it would be lovely, I would give my right arm to take a picture of the Milky Way uh, this way, right? But we're in the plane of the Milky Way, so it's very, very hard to figure out what's happening, right? That's the whole challenge of this work. But here's another galaxy, which is probably something like the Milky Way. Okay, this is the, uh, called the Whirlpool Galaxy, or M51. And I show it to you because it, you can see that 
you can see these things I was talking about uh, now on a grand galactic scale. You can see all these dense lanes, which are giant molecular clouds, and peppered along the arms of these red patches, which are exactly like the Orion Nebula, places where stars are forming. So, so the young stars that are forming from the molecular clouds are tracing out the spiral structure of the galaxy. And that's one of my main interests, is to use the molecular clouds to map out their distribution and, and therefore determine the spiral structure of the Milky Way. This is a, this is a map, just again, a C map, one of these radio maps. This one happens to be not made by our telescope, but by a bigger telescope. But you can see how beautifully the, the emission in the radio traces out these spiral arms. And so we, we assume uh, that the same thing is happening in the Milky Way. Okay? Okay, last, last bullet slide. But the, the molecular clouds are so important, I want to make sure all the key facts are uh, gotten across, right? So they're the main sites of star formation. That is why most astronomers are so interested in molecular clouds, because they study star formation. It's a very, very complicated process. Uh, Ten times more people study star formation than galactic structure. Um, half, of the, half of the gas in the galaxy, we now know, is in this chemical, is in this chemical form. Okay, so half the gas in the galaxy is chemical. There's, there's a whole new field of study called astrochemistry, uh, looking at all the amazing and, and rare uh, chemical reactions that take place in these clouds because the conditions are so different than what you can produce on Earth. So, so, so we have all of these, some very common molecules, but some very exotic ones as well, discovered in these dense cores and molecular clouds. Uh, they are well-defined traces of galactic structure. The key point here is that uh, unlike in, in the optical, where you can't see very far because of that veil of dust, with radio telescopes you can peer right through the dust and look all the way across the galaxy and detect these molecular clouds, which is a few minutes of observations. Um, these clouds, the, the universe is uh, mainly hydrogen and helium. Uh, helium is a noble gas, so it doesn't form molecules, so when you do form molecules, it's almost purely molecular hydrogen, right? 99.999. Unfortunately, uh, molecular hydrogen, because of the structure of that molecule, it's symmetric, it's, it's said to have no dipole moment, and so it doesn't emit in the radio regime the way, the way other molecules do. And fortunately, there's another molecule. After hydrogen and helium, the next two abundant elements are carbon and oxygen, because they're the common ashes of nuclear burning in stars. So the stars burn hydrogen and helium into carbon and oxygen and nitrogen. So these are common as well. They're way down, but, but they're common and they form a good stable molecule. And so what we do is we observe the emission from carbon monoxide and we use it as a stain or a tracer of where the molecular gas is. So it's a very indirect thing, but fortunately this ratio of CO to H2 seems to be pretty constant. And so it seems to be a quite faithful tracer of where the molecules are. Okay, so how do we observe? Um, so now I'm getting into like, what, ex what really are we looking at? And, and how do we detect things? Okay, so here's, here's a, here we are inside a molecular cloud. Here's that ratio, one CO molecule to 100,000 H2 molecules. Uh, so you have all this H2 around, and then you have one CO molecule, and occasionally, a, 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 well, more than occasionally, a hydrogen molecule will come along and get the CO molecule spinning. Now, because uh, at, at, at very small scales, because of quantum mechanics, uh, the, the, the molecule can't just slow down in any way it wants to. It has to continue to rotate at exactly the same rate until at some point, in the case of CO, it's usually months, like a few, maybe six months will go by, and then s spontaneously and unpredictably, it'll slow down. It'll make a jump, it'll make what, what we call a, a, a transition from a higher rotational state, a higher energy state, to a lower energy state. Right, so it suddenly slows down, and so now where does the energy go? It goes off as a, as a photon of radiation, at 115 gigahertz. Okay, so every molecule has a different frequency that it emits, and that allows us to identify all these different molecules because they all have their own fingerprint. They all have their own set of frequencies that they emit. Then what happens? Well, this molecular cloud is halfway across the galaxy, and so it just it takes, it takes a journey of some tens of thousands of years to come across the galaxy, and then finally, some night when my student is sitting there sleeping, in comes the 150 gigahertz. But don't worry, the computer got, got recorded the result anyways. Okay, okay. so, um, yes. So, um, so you would think that all we needed to do, uh, w the way we run a radio telescope, this is just the antenna, right? It's, just, it's called a Cassegrain configuration. It focuses the radiation down into that hole where we have a detector. And so you can imagine we, just, we could just hook a radio up to the detector 
And then we would tune it to 115 gigahertz, which is the frequency of the CO molecule, and we would just you know, record how much power we get uh, in each direction. But that is, it's not that simple, and it's not that simple because of uh, something called the Doppler, Doppler effect, which most of you have probably, probably heard about and you've all experienced. If you're standing along the side of a highway and a car goes by, it has a higher frequency when it's coming towards you and a lower frequency when it's going away. And loosely speaking, what happens is that when an object is moving, like a car, the, the, the sound waves get bunched up in front of it, so, the, so you hear a higher frequency or a, a higher frequency, which means a shorter wavelength because the waves are getting bunched up in front of it. And, uh, and the opposite happens when, you, when the car's going away, the waves get gets drawn out. And a similar, thing, a similar thing happens with electromagnetic radiation, like radio waves and, and light. Uh, so that's, that's the red shift, or the, Dopp the Doppler shift. So as I, I say, that's our bread and butter, because that, most of our in interesting information on the structure of the galaxy uh, comes through the Doppler effect, the fact that we can measure the Doppler shift. Because we know exactly what frequency the carbon monoxide molecule is supposed to emit, and then we can measure what frequency we actually detect. And then there's a very simple relationship between the frequency shift and the velocity of the cloud. Okay? So here we are. And so if the cloud is just sitting out there and not moving with respect to us, we will detect it at 115 gigahertz. If it's moving away from us, it'll, we'll, we'll detect it at a lower frequency, uh, 114. It's coming towards us, 116. Okay? So you can imagine we could, what we need to do is Hook, hook up our telescope to or go to Radio Shack and get a gigahertz band Sony, Sony radio. Okay, you can't do that, but someday. Um, but what you can do is just like hook it up, and then you can scan across this thing, right? And so, you, so mainly what you would hear is static, because I, as I said, there's not much interference. So you're not going to hear taxi cabs and radio stations. You're just going to hear static. Shh. But as you scan across, when you get to 114 gigahertz, you'll hear a pure tone. And then it'll go away again as you keep going, right? So just a pure, just for a very, if you tune the radio very precisely, you'll hear a tone, you'll hear a high level of signal at 114 gigahertz, and that'll tell you that there's a molecular cloud out there which is moving away from us at a certain speed, which you can calculate from the difference between the rest frequency, which is this, and that frequency. And, and these are all just, you know, exaggerated. This, the shifts are actually not that large. They're much, much smaller, but you get the idea. Okay, so, so uh, and also what's nice is that you can, have them all, you can have many clouds along the line of sight. So if you aim your telescope through the plane of the Milky Way, you may see five, six, seven, eight different clouds along the line of sight. And unlike in the optical where you can only see the first cloud, which is sitting right in front of your nose, in our case, we can see all of the clouds along the line of sight, and we can measure the velocity for each one. Uh, this one, this cloud, is transparent to this cloud because they're at different frequencies. So this radiation just goes right through that cloud, and this radiation goes right through both of those clouds because they're all at different frequencies, okay? So if you could, if you could sort of have your assistant listening to the radio, we don't really listen. Uh, our engineer likes to say that a radio telescope is a telescope you don't look through attached to a radio you don't listen to. <laughs> Which doesn't excite the kids very much, but um, but um, but you can imagine in some way just measuring the power or the noise coming in, the signal strength as a function of frequency as you turn the dial, and you get this, right? You get a beep at 16 and a beep at 15, and that's a spectrum. That's our basic unit of of, uh, of data, okay? And so of course we do that now. Now what I just described of just turning the dial, that's a perfectly good way to do it. The reason that's not a great way to do it is because you're only listening, uh, 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 accumulating signal from this cloud for a very short time and then you keep going. Whereas these signals are so weak that you really need to look at them for a fairly long time in order to accumulate enough signal to actually hear it above the static. Okay, so that's not the ideal way to do it. The ideal way to do it is to have lots of radios. So this is, a, this is a quite a busy figure, but this is, this is the whole experiment in a nutshell, as I say. Right, so the way we do it is here's our telescope. Right, this is, the, this is a, a version, you know, sort of a schematic of the galaxy. Here we are out at the sun, and we're observing through the, through the plane of the galaxy. And um, what we do is we take the signal and we feed it into a whole bank of radios, 115, 512 radios in our case, and each radio is tuned to a slightly different frequency. Right? And so they're all listening at the same time, and the computer, 20 times a second, just reads out the amount of power which is being detected at each frequency, and it just plots it up just the way I did on the previous slide. Um, and that's a CO spectrum, right? So in this case, what we see is, um, 
these, if we have clouds along the line of sight through the galaxy, um, do we, have, we don't have a pointer, do we? Because this is losing. You know what I can use is the um, one, of, one of those posters because it keeps like conking up. Oh, do you have a, do you have a pointer? It's not a pointer. Oh, oh, I see. Okay, I'll use this. All right. So you can see, there's, we, we look through a typical uh, line of sight through the galaxy. Uh, clouds have different velocities, and, um, and so they will all show up at different uh, frequencies, but you can convert this axis from frequency to velocity. Okay? And so that's, that's the basic unit of, 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 of a spectrum, and we do that. Um, you know, typically, those observations take a few minutes. The, uh, the important point to, to point, the, let me see if it goes. Yeah. So the important point to make here is that. It, it, all of our studies only work because the galaxy rotates differentially. It rotates faster in the inner regions than in the outer regions. If the, rota if the galaxy rotated like a phonograph record or like a merry-go-round, then all of these lines would all show up at zero, right? Because if you're on a merry-go-round, all the other horses are not moving with respect to you. They're, moving, they're going in a circle, but they're not moving with respect to you. And the Doppler shift only tells you about relative motions of the source and the detector. So if you're on a merry-go-round, you get no Doppler shifts from any, any horses, and that would be the same thing. Fortunately, uh, spiral galaxies, including our own, rotate in a differential manner, like water going down a drain, loosely speaking, so the inner parts spin around fast, so that if you see a cloud which is moving at 100 kilometers per second, it means it's deep in the inner galaxy. So that's a crucial point uh, in, in how we sort out the structure of the galaxy. We, we use velocity as a surrogate for distance. Okay. Um, this is the uh, this is another view a rear view of our of our telescope uh, in Cambridge. The um, let's see what we got here. So uh, here's the Gore-Tex screen. Um, that's an optical telescope. You, if you might imagine it's kind of hard to uh, uh, point a telescope like this. You're looking you're, look, you're observing in the daytime. You're observing through a Gore-Tex screen. You're actually in the control room in the other room. So occasionally you have to actually have a have a sanity sanity check. So what we do is we. This optical scope is aligned with the radio axis, and we open the Gore-Tex, and we just come in and we have it point at lots of stars all over the sky, and uh, we, we record the errors on each star, and then we do a least squares fit, right, and we optimize the pointing. Okay, it's very nice, very nice system, works perfectly fine. Um, the, uh, oh yeah, so, so the, the, the signals that we're detecting, uh, you know, I, I talked about hearing a loud beep when, you, when you, we get on these molecular clouds, but in fact, these signals are extraordinarily weak. Uh, someone once calculated that all of the all of the energy collected by all of the radio telescopes since radio astronomy was invented in the 1940s and 50s all of that energy together is less than the energy of a single snowflake hitting the ground so we're looking at extraordinarily weak signals T uh, in, 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 the, in the units that we use typical lines typical intensities of these signals are one degree Kelvin and the amount of noise or static that we're contending with is typically six, seven, eight hundred Kelvin. Okay, so the noise is hundreds and hundreds of times stronger than the signal. So how do you how do you ever get around that? You use statistics. You use the fact that noise is a random process. So that if you, no matter how weak the signal is, if you wait long enough, the noise is effectively going to average to zero, whereas the actual signal will eventually peak out, like like uh, you know coming out of the grass as it, as it as it's cut. Okay. So you can always detect a signal, you just have to wait long enough. So um, in order to reduce the, um, the amount of static, one of the main sources of static is the receiver itself, okay, the electronics. So one of the ways of reducing the static is to keep the receiver very cold. Uh, we keep the receiver as, almost as cold as humanly possible. It's kept at 4 degrees Kelvin, um, which is minus 452 degrees Fahrenheit. So 4 degrees above absolute zero using liquid helium. Okay, So this is a helium doer which contains the liquid helium, which has to be refilled every 12 hours when we're observing, every 24 hours when we're not observing. At the, uh, also, we, uh, in our case, the liquid helium is even more important because at the heart of the receiver is something called the Josephson Junction, uh, which requires the use of superconductors. And of course, they, the metals would not become superconducting uh, until uh, they get below about 10K. Okay, so we have to keep this thing super cold. 
uh, I pointed out the whiteboard just to, just to make the point that uh, this telescope is also used in, in quite a few Harvard undergraduate courses. It's a wonderful pedagogical tool. Uh, students learn how to use the telescope. It's very hands-on. There's no operators. They just get in there and tinker with it. They learn how it works. They learn what the data means. And then they go and they, they're given a whole night on the telescope. And they have to design an experiment to measure how fast the galaxy rotates, uh, what the distribution of molecules is, and so on. So it's, so it's a great resource for, for teaching at the university. Um, if, you, if I zoom in on sort of one of the plates here, you see that virtually everything in the whole dome is labeled, right? So that's, there's two purposes for that. One is for the sake of the students so they can actually see how all the signals are processed and amplified and isolated and so on. Uh, and also when, when a student calls me at 3 o'clock in the morning and I tell him to go tune the gun oscillator by 10 degrees, he knows, he knows how to do that, right? So everything is labeled. Um, this is um, the procedure we go through about every 12 hours to, to put liquid helium into the telescope. This is a, my postdoc, Tulin, and she's dipping the, these doers of liquid helium to, to measure the level. And then we have this lift which goes up to the level of the, the doer. And then we use helium gas, which is, which is here, to uh, force the liquid helium through the, through the tube. Okay, uh, last Saturday, uh, one of my students had a, had a, made a, a really heroic effort to do the fill. The fill was doing within minutes, and she got to the telescope, and, and there was a drift five feet high, and she couldn't get out to the roof, and she tried to go out the door, out the window of the control room, and, and then she came back, and she, she got a shovel, and shovel with one hand outside the door, and then she got to the dome door, and then there was a huge ice block there, and so anyways, you always have to, you have to do these fills, you know, New Year's Eve and Christmas Day, and you know, because you always have to keep it at four degrees Kelvin. Otherwise, you threaten. And so here's Tulin uh, pouring liquid, he liquid nitrogen, which is also used in an outer can. And here's an actual helium fill in, pro in, in progress. This is the control room. Um, I'll just zoom in on the control monitor. There's a couple of fun things there. There's a little gauge that tells us how much helium is left, right, full and empty. It tells us how much more time we have before we have to do, do a helium fill. Here's one of those spectra that I was talking about. This is the actual data. This is all you get to see at the, at the radio telescope. You don't see any pretty images like I've been showing you. You just see spectra, right? And it's only much later when you have thousands of spectra that you put them all together and make these maps. Okay, but this is a spectrum with radio velocity along here. This is the strength of the signal, and these are all these different peaks at different clouds along the line of sight. Uh, the the dewar temperature is always displayed. Uh, when it starts to go up, it sends the computer sends email to everybody who knows how to do a helium fill. But if it's Sunday, if it's Sunday morning at 3 a.m., that doesn't help very much. Well, it's for the students, it usually does work. But, but uh, anyways. Um, uh, so uh, here's the rest frequency of the, of the line, for example, 115, 271, 201. So you enter commands here. So that, that's sort of what, you know, this is what you, where you're sitting most of the time. Uh, this is just a little, little fun fact. This is our original computer. So the older people in the room will appreciate this. Uh, this is a Data General mini computer, which is a really hot, hot machine back in 1973. It cost us $10,000. I had 16-bit words, 64 kilobytes of core memory. I don't know if you, anyone remembers kilobytes. But, but the entire telescope was run almost as well as it is now. And the data was written on, this, on these uh, punch tapes, paper punch tapes. And it's not, nowadays, you don't see bits very often. But these are actual bits, right? So it's like 16 bits across. So that's the actual data. And you can read the individual bits. And this, this, it was very, lots of fun to work with because you had these, it was a 16-bit machine. And you had these 16 switches. And you could toggle in addresses. And you could deposit. You could change individual memory locations. Uh, and then just start the program running again. So you're basically doing programming with those switches, which people don't do anymore. But it was, it was quite a fun machine. OK, why does it take so long? OK, let's go back to this picture that I showed you before. This optical photograph probably took somebody two seconds, uh, you, know, if, you know, if they want to get a nice deep image and see the nebula. Um, this radio map took us 16 months observing five hours a day. Five hours is how long Orion is up in the sky uh, high enough to be observed with a radio telescope. Okay? So a big difference in time. Why? Well, because someone used a 6 megapixel camera. right? That means that camera has 6 million pixels. Uh, and each pixel sent, uh, samples a different spot on the sky. And then so you click the shutter and you get a picture. Right? The, the problem we have is that we have only one pixel. Could be one pixel. And not, only, and not only that, but as I mentioned, the, the signal is very weak. Okay, so we have to we have to integrate to, to beat down. Oops, we have to integrate to beat down the noise. So typically three to four minutes. Sometimes you're looking at another galaxy. You might have to integrate for an hour per point. 
but typically a few minutes. Okay, so that's why it takes so long. Is we have this, you have a single pixel. Uh, this is the pixel up here. So the, the detector is very sensitive. You know, we've got all this trouble of cooling it down to liquid helium temperature, but there's only one of them. Okay, so we, so when we observe, we only get the average emission from a tiny spot on the sky called the beam, which is this little little dot here, which you may be able to see, right? And it's nine arc minutes across. So that's our resolution. That determines the resolution of our observation, just like the, the size of the pixels on your TV screen determine how, how much detail you can see of the football players. Okay. So um, again, just to drive that point home again, if we, if we decide we want to map a little region of the sky where we think there may be molecular gas because there's a lack of stars, the way we have to do it is we have to look at, oops, is we have to look at one point at a time. Bump, 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 bump. And, and, and build up these images uh, uh, when we're done. You know, each position gives us a spectrum, and, and then ultimately we use that data to make a map. Okay? So that's the process. Now, uh, you say, well, well you know, gosh, all, all that trouble and all you get is this map, right? Well, you know, that's not true. As I said, at every single position we get a spectrum, right? So essentially we have a third dimension to the data which is not displayed on that map. E even this poster here, which is shows this image of the entire Milky Way, that's, that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the amount of information that's in the survey because at every single point in that map we have a spectrum. Right? So in fact, uh, our data is, our maps are three dimensional. Okay? So uh, this, this is meant to, so this, this is just the same, this is just a piece of the Orion map, right? And I'm gonna just turn it into a grayscale and then let it spin, right? So, so there's a lot more information in these maps. So what you're seeing is the velocity, so the third dimension is velocity, right? So it would be nice if the third dimension were actually distance, but it's not. So you're not looking at a real object in three dimensions rotating. It's two dimensions on the sky, and then the third dimension is velocity. But there's an awful lot of information there. You can see rings and expansion and, and jets and things and, and so on in that map. But that's why the, that's why the data is, is such a challenge to analyze. <clears throat> So uh, let me go back and just say, say a little bit more now about the, the Milky Way. Uh, and first of all, um, you know, again, this is, this is a, uh, an optical image. And you can see that if you, if you look at an external spiral galaxy like NGC 891, edge on, which happens to be edge on to our line of sight, it looks rather like this panorama, right? Because that's because we are indeed right in the plane of the Milky Way. Uh, and so we see a very similar thing. These are all these molecular clouds in, in NGC 891. So here's a highly schematic view of the Milky Way. Uh, these are the, you know, just a schematic image of the spiral arms. The sun is out here. Uh, this is from edge on. The sun is here. We have these globular clusters, which were formed early and tend to scatter around the center of the galaxy. Uh, the point to what I, that I made before is that uh, we can't see optically much further than a region like that. Right? So most of the galaxy was excluded from study until the 1950s and 60s when, when radio astronomy got going. Uh, the first person who got his arms around the entire Milky Way was Hollow Shapley, who was the director of the Harvard College Observatory for more than 30 years, uh, one of my heroes. Uh, and the way he got a handle on the size of the Milky Way is that he looked at the globular clusters. And so he studied these globular clusters, which are, the, which are so basically he looked above and below the dust. And he saw these objects, and what he discovered is, hey, the objects aren't surrounding, the, they, aren't, they aren't uniformly around the sun, they're mainly over in that direction, in the direction of Sagittarius, and they seem to, seem to form a sort of a spherical distribution about a point about 30,000 light years that way. So he, was, he is sometimes called the Copernicus of the Milky Way because what he did, just like Copernicus showed that the, that the Earth wasn't the center of the solar system, he showed that the sun was not the center of the Milky Way. So here's, here's a headline from the 1921 uh, Boston Sunday Advertiser indicating that, Harvard, that the universe is a thousand times bigger, Harvard astronomer discovers, right? So he, he realized that, because, and, and of course they call it the universe because at that time uh, the Milky Way was thought to be the entire universe, okay? They had seen these external spiral nebula, but they called them nebula because they thought they were very close and they, they, they didn't realize that they were actually galaxies just like, just like our own, okay? Um, just, uh, just, just as totally irrelevant uh, side, side light. Um, Hollow Shapley's office, when he was the director, was right here, which is directly below our telescope. And I'm sure he wouldn't like our rumbling dome. So it's sort of good that we, it worked out the way it did. But. Anyways, in the 1950s, people studied, worked really hard studying the, the distribution of young stars that have just formed in this region around the, and they discovered that, hey, 
they seem to line up in three lanes. Okay? Uh, and, and so that was the first evidence that we were in a spiral galaxy. So you can see the lane here, a lane here, and a lane here. It's not all that convincing, but uh, he did get a standing ovation at the American Astronomical Society meeting as being the first direct evidence that indicated that we were in a spiral galaxy. The real progress came with, the, uh, with, with radio astronomy. Uh, you look across the galaxy in a direction like that, and to make a point I, I made before, if the galaxy were just rotating as a phonograph record, that's what you would see. You would just see one big strong line at zero, and you would have no information whatsoever on the structure of the Milky Way. And I would be a, an economist or something. But, but this is all, that's why Bob, bread and butter is the fact that the galaxy rotates differentially, and so what you really see is that. Okay, so the emission is all spread out, spread out in velocity thanks to the differential rotation of the galaxy. Uh, so if you look on that side, of course everything's moving away from us, right, because the galaxy is spinning like this. So if you look on this side, everything's going away, so all the velocities are positive. If you look on the other side, they're all negative. So that's what you see, right? And so, uh, again, as I pointed out, um, you, can, you can relate velocity to distance, so if you see something at a low velocity, uh, it has to be fairly close to the sun, so it may be here. Uh, as you look at a higher velocity peak, that has to be further out, maybe at B. And if you see a really high velocity feature, that has to be deep in the inner galaxy. And see, so there's really, you can really work out there, you can actually work out directly, there's a relationship between distance and velocity. There's some, there's some difficulties with that, but that's the basic idea. Um, this is a, now this is again just a map, sort of like what I showed you before, you can see Orion in the lower right. So this is now a map of the entire Milky Way. Now we didn't set, off to, set out to do this originally. Um, uh, we didn't, you know, it's not all uniform. It was, it was done by many people for many different reasons, many different graduate students, uh, basically every different color there. So that shows how the Milky Way was actually observed by all these different surveys. Uh, basically, you, you can see probably uh, 10, different, 10 to 12 different PhD theses in there, right? Uh, and each person got a little chunk of the sky, a chunk of the Milky Way to study and write, write a thesis about. So, so that's how it divided up, and it turned out that we ended up with about 34 different surveys. Eventually we said, hey, we, we almost have it all, so let's just fill in the gaps and, and, and publish it, right? So this is, this is the, um, certainly our most important uh, publication in 2001, where, where we published all of our surveys from the past 20 years in this astrophysical journal research paper, and, 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 and never before and never again, I believe, Will the AppJ allow a five-page foldout? I've never seen anything like it. They, they, didn't, they didn't blink an eye, and they said, sure, no problem. And so we have this five-page foldout, which is basically that, that image up there, a little, little bit more, uh, more details. Um, OK, let, let's, go, let's think about this data again. Again, a point I've made is that at every point on this map, you have a spectrum, right? So what you really have is a three-dimensional data set. Okay, so if you can imagine looking down on the data set from above, that's what you would see. Okay? Now even radio, even astronomers, when, when you're at meetings and you introduce one of these weird diagrams called the longitude, this angle here is called longitude, this is velocity, so this is a longitude velocity diagram. And when you introduce those at, a, at an astronomy meeting, you hear groans. Because it's, it's really hard to relate to, right? Because this is not distance, unfor unfortunately. So it's really, but, but what this is really is just a, a highly distorted map of the distribution of molecular gas in the galaxy. You just have to know how to interpret it. And, um, and so our group is, is, is particularly adept at, at interpreting and, and, uh, and, and uh, identifying features in these so-called longitude velocity diagrams. And so that diagram is what's on the bottom of that poster. Okay, so, that, so these two maps are just two perspectives on what is really a three-dimensional data set. So the data set is very much, almost essentially is the same as, as a CAT scan of a human brain, right? So we have the same, uh, you know, we have the same problems, like with a doctor trying to identify a tumor in a brain after a CAT scan or an MRI, he has this three-dimensional data set and he takes cuts through it and he cuts it different ways. And we do exactly the same thing. In fact, there's, there's a, um, currently a project going on at Harvard called the Astronomical Medicine Project. Now, there's been billions of dollars spent on, on uh, writing software to uh, interpret MRIs. Okay, the budget for that is probably 10 times the entire budget of astronomy in the, in the United States. So we, but we can leverage all of, that, all of that work to analyze our data because it's exactly the same problem. Okay? So here's those two maps. Okay? 
the, the sky map and the velocity map. So what do you see in that map? Well, there's a lot of stuff you see. It's hard to come to grips with. Uh, again, so this axis is, is, is longitude, just angle along the Milky Way in both cases. But in this case, it's velocity on this axis as opposed to just angle up and down. So what can you see? Well, one thing you see is this galactic rotation. Okay, so you look on one side of the galactic center, all the emission is positive, which means it's moving away from us. On the other side, it's negative, which means it's coming towards us. Um, if you go back to this image, remember, you know, it's only relative motions that cause Doppler shifts. So if you look directly toward the galactic center, and everything's moving in circular orbits, you should see no Doppler shifts at all. So all of those lines should overlap at zero. Right? I sort of mentioned that before. So Because everything's moving perpendicular to our line of sight. So what we should see when we look toward the galactic center is just zero velocity emission. What we actually see is just the opposite. Okay? We see huge expansion motions and very fast rotation, but mainly expansion. You see emission from minus 300 kilometers a second to almost plus 300 kilometers per second. So that's actual expansion of gas from the galactic center uh, due to God knows what. To, due to an outburst phase in the Milky Way in the past possibly due to infall on a black hole. There's, there's lots of theories for what causes that outflow. But it, again, it's, it's not what you'd expect. It was quite unexpected. But it's very, it's very um, dramatic. You can also see spiral arms. This is a very obvious one. This is called the Perseus arm, right? So it's a linear feature. And I've overlaid some other spiral arms, the outer arm and the local arm. And there's a lot of arms in here too, but it takes a lot of work to sort of pull them out. Okay, and that's sort of a lot of, a lot of things we do. Um, here's the poster, which shows those two maps. As I said, you, you're welcome to have copies. Okay, so this is, a, this is a, um, an artist conception of the Milky Way. Now, we can't take a picture like that. But, but, but an artist, guided by many, many research studies and experts in the field, um, ha has come up, with this, uh, came up with this image of the Milky Way. And it shows some interesting uh, features of the Milky Way that have just been discovered or proposed uh, in the past um, 10 to 20 years. Okay? And one of the most important ones is that the Milky Way is, is a spiral galaxy, but it's also a special kind of spiral. It's called a Bard spiral. And that simply means that the center, the central uh, concentration of stars is not in a spherical distribution, but it's rather in an oblong distribution. Okay? And it's just many theoretical studies have shown that if you start off with a spherical distribution of stars, there's a great tendency uh, for it to go into this more stable oblong configuration. So about half of the spiral galaxies are so-called bad spirals. I'll show you an extreme example of a bad spiral galaxy. This is uh, NGC 1300. This is the granddaddy of all bad spirals. Right? So you have this huge bar in the middle and these fantastic symmetric arms coming off either end. Okay? So that made us wonder if we're, if we're in a bad So bars, bars tend to drive quite pretty symmetric spiral structure. Not always, but it was an interesting find, a very interesting find, an important find. And so what, what is, what the evidence is accumulating now that we may have something like that happening in the Milky Way. We have this arm called the, 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 the uh, Scutum Centaurus arm, which comes off one end of the bar, and we have the Perseus arm coming off the other end of the bar. And then there are some minor arms in between. But these seem, it has been suggested, it's far from proven, but it's been suggested that these two arms dominate the spiral structure of the galaxy. Uh, so that's one of the issues that we've been deeply involved in. <clears throat> um, but, but this map is, um, again, an artist's rendition uh, based on the best knowledge we have. But in order to, to fill in the details, it required a fair amount of interpolation, extrapolation, and in some cases, just wishful thinking. Okay? <laughs> so what do we really know about the distribution of, of, of um, gas in the galaxy. Okay? Well, let me, let me strip off all the labels, go to a grayscale representation, and what I'm going to show you is the arms that most people agreed upon uh, in uh, late 2007, early 2008. Uh, you know, if you sat down, most people would agree that these arms existed. They could see them in the longitude velocity diagrams, that I, like the one I showed you. Um, <clears throat> but if you, um, if, you, if you, especially if you take away the the galaxy artist drawing, you can see something rather disturbing about, about what we know about the galaxy. Basically, we only see half the galaxy, right? Okay, so, so all, this, all this discussion about the Milky Way having a beautiful symmetry, where is it? Okay, how can you have symmetry if you only have half of it? 
it's the other side, but you know, we, so we don't see much over there, right? It's very hard. It gets very, you know, it's, it's very, it's very difficult. Things, are, the inverse square law, affects us like it does all astronomers. Um, in any case, what we have done, what we have contributed to this picture, in the last few years, are, are two spiral arms. <clears throat> One of them called the the uh, the phosphate kilopascal arm. This was quite a quite a startling discover discovery because what we found was that this this arm was a virtual mirror image of this arm. Okay, so uh, one of the um, most respected person people in the uh, in the field noted that this was the first direct evidence that the galaxy really had a twofold symmetry. Okay, and uh, it was it was it was quite unexpected. This this arm had been known since the 19, 1950s. It was very obvious in the data. Um, uh, most galaxies are pretty messy. Okay, I've showed you some really pretty galaxies so far, but this is more typical, right? So you have you have spiral arms in there, but you know where are the main arms? You know how many arms are there? It's it's a rather it's quite a, it's quite a mess. Okay, and it's 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 a bit depressing to go through a, a, a catalog of of galaxies because most of them look like that. Okay, so this was very exciting that hey, at last we got something that. That suggests symmetry in the galaxy. Okay. Um, how much time? I need to know how much time because I can skip over five more minutes. Okay. Okay. So um, let, let me just say. So yeah, th this is the quote. Some of, some of the first evidence that the galaxy has a twofold symmetry. Uh, let me just very quickly show. You, I can't get into details on how we found this thing. Uh, it was quite an exciting uh, time. But we, if you zoom in on the central part of the longitude velocity diagram, so this is just zooming in between plus and minus 12 degrees, uh, this, and this turn it to a grayscale, which happens to be very, a lot better for just seeing linear features. Um, you can see this structure here, which is, hits you in the face, okay? That's the near, uh, uh, the three kiloparsec arm. No one, I learned about it on my mother's knee in the 1950s, okay? And you can see that uh, there it is, and, what, and remember, when you look directly toward the galactic center, you should not see any radial motions. But in fact, in this case, when you look right toward the galactic center, the arm has a velocity of minus 53 kilometers per second. So it's, it's absolutely unique in the galaxy in that sense. Most of the other arms are coming through here. There's a really, really strong lane here. All the other arms in the galaxy are behaving themselves, and they're going to zero velocity at zero longitude. Not that one, okay? So it was a real puzzle. What was causing that? Well, there was two prevailing theories. There was an explosion, and this was an arm that was exploded out from the center. But if that's the case, where's the backside? Right? Where's the backside of the arm? You know, you look over here, you don't see it. Okay? And um, so that's a three, expanding three kiloplastic arm discovered in 1957. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is jump to a, another version of this LV diagram, which we created. I was in the process of, crea of, of preparing a talk for, for a meeting on spiral structure, and I just wanted to show people the, the known arms as clearly as possible so that people are at least all on the same page in terms of believing the arms that, you know, that, that most people believe in. So I just wanted to show them all. But in, in the process, I, I made this figure, and then I made this. Now, I don't know if you can see that, but it, it's, you know, at, at first, it's not all that impressive. It sort of looked like a, pair, a set of muddy tire tracks running through the middle of the, middle of the LV diagram, okay? Here's this galactic center, right? So you have these two lanes. And uh, I'll tell you, um, when I first saw that, you know, I, I've seen a lot of interesting things in my career. Most of the time when you see something interesting, the more you look at it, the less interesting it becomes, okay? It, it sort of dissolves like cigarette ash in your fingers. It's just, oh, it's very heartbreaking. Okay, in this case, it was the opposite. So I, I saw this thing, and it, the funny thing is I went home at night, and, and I have a good relationship with my wife, but I didn't even mention it to her because maybe I just want to jinx myself, but also, also I know what usually happens. I'm going to go in the next day, and I'm going to calculate how big it is and how what the mass is, and it's not going to match up at all. Okay? It turns out that the more I looked at it, it the, the remarkable thing is that these things, when you calculate their properties, they're virtual twins, okay? The, the one in the, the far side arm is much weaker and harder to see because it's three times further away. Okay, so that's to be expected. Okay, if you look at the velocity, it's almost the same velocity, you know, within three kilometers a second in the other direction, okay? Um, 
Just moving on. Since then, I've gone to Australia, got much, much, much better data on this thing. So now you can, it's somewhat more believable now, right? You can see this thing. No doubt, nobody has raised serious doubts about it. Um, these are all of the properties of the, the two arms that we worked out. I don't have to go through them all. But basically, they're symmetric twins, OK? The other thing that we've added back in 2011 is a large structure way out here, the most distant arm that's ever been seen because the sun is here, and we spotted this thing way out here. Okay, first in the, in the atomic gas and then with CO observations. And it's kind of remarkable that the most distant molecular clouds in the galaxy have been detected by the smallest radio telescope able to observe molecular clouds. Okay, so one of the projects we're working on right now is mapping this thing very thoroughly in CO emission. The, re the significance of that arm is that we believe through modeling and analysis that it is the extension of the Scutum Centaurus arm. So there's this theory that the Scutum Centaurus arm is one of the two major arms of the galaxy, but this is all we knew about it. That doesn't look very major, right? So now we think, well, wow, if that's really the end of this, it's going almost 360 degrees around the galaxy, okay? So that supports this idea that Scutum Centaurus is really a um, major arm of the galaxy. And one of the things we, we can do now, it's a very well-defined test. If you go back to our image, you know, we found this piece here, the outer scutum centaurus arm. And again, addressing this issue of symmetry, one direct test that we can perform, and we can get a yes or no answer to, is if, if there's a symmetry in the galaxy, then the outer scutum centaurus arm that we discovered should look like the Perseus arm at the opposite position. And the nice thing is that the Perseus arm is very close to the sun, okay? So we have lots of good data on the Perseus arm, so we just have to go really, work really hard. These observations take about 45 minutes per point because it's so far away. But if we map this thing thoroughly and compare the properties with the Perseus arm, we'll have a yes, no answer on whether there's any symmetry there, as we saw between the near and the far three KPC arms. So those are the type of issues we're, we're dealing with. I went through the catalog. This is one of the galaxies that I think probably looks like the Milky Way, M109. Um, so there's a lot of work ahead, um, surprisingly. Um, but that's, I think, what I, I definitely will stop there and just ask for any questions.